side. Okay, so uh, talking about the requirements, uh, last uh, class we more or less reached this point, uh, we must produce uh, uh, what we call the requirement document. So uh, imagine that as a sort of checklist of uh, uh, the characteristics of the system, the mandatory characteristic of the system, what the system needs to do, really needs to do, to be compliant with your vision and with your design. Hmm? Imagine a document that you can ship to some, ship to and send to someone else and say, please, can you implement this? Huh? And uh, this document should be, imagine the contractual basis, like a contract where you actually are describing what the system needs to do. In other words, all the information should be there. There should be no ambiguity, no open points, no, no aspects left to the interpretation of the reader. We should be precise. Actually, the sentence we are going to repeat many times over and over is we need to decide what is in and what is out of the system what should be implemented and what, and what should not be implemented and how. Hmm? We'll try to keep the what and the how separated because we need to describe them in different ways. So let's try to, to uh, analyze uh, uh, more formally uh, what kind of information we need to write in this uh, requirements document. Yeah, we already mentioned briefly the difference between user requirements and system requirements, hmm? meaning that a part of the requirements should be shared with the end, the end user, should, should be easy to read, uh, easy to understand, and should form the basis on the mutual understanding and mutual uh, agreement between the client, the customer, who wants to, do, to demand the system and the people that are going to implement it. But these are not enough. No? In the user requirements, I can describe what kind of functionality the site will provide, what kind of characteristics the user interface will have, but uh, I won't specify, for example, the programming languages, the libraries, uh, the file locations, or other, let's say, more specific details. But these more specific details are also important because we want maybe to constrain to make some design choices during the process. So there are some uh, information, there is some, from, some information that is not directly use, uh, useful for the end user of the system, but is nevertheless important for the specification. And this, we called it uh, developer or system requirements. So information that will be needed by the developers, where is the database, uh, how, uh, how is it implemented, what is the structure, of the, the data structures, and so on. Uh, um, these information are important not for the developers, but not usually they are not understandable or readable by the end users. Hmm? So that we, we split uh, actually two, two levels of details, one more general and the other more specific about the same aspects. And uh, last time we already made a, a short example about uh, uh, one single functionality as seen by the end user means a lot of different uh, items that needs to be, need to be implemented individually by, by the developers, okay? Um, and then and today we spend more time in trying to understand this crucial uh, set of definitions that we need to analyze in our system. Uh, requirements in general are characteristics of the system that must be present in the final product, in the final result. And these characteristics may be, we call them functional or non-functional requirements, or in other, in other, we, can, we may also call them quality requirements. Hmm? What is the difference? The difference is between what the system needs to do, functional requirements, and how the system will do the functions that are required by the functional requirements. I mean, if I say um, 
the system or should provide a login mechanism. This is a, one function of the system. One, uh, this sentence, the system should provide a login mechanism, is one functional requirement. Then how do we provide it? Well, we should require passwords that are that have a given length, a given strength. We should require uh, the login to be um, maybe usable both from uh, desktop computers and from mobile devices and so on. So we are putting additional constraints over a function, the qualities of this, of this functionality. Hmm? Uh, this is a sort of a sim too simple example or easy, an easy example where we are attaching quality requirements Quality doesn't mean beautiful, it means other adjectives, other qualities, other properties that we should take into account when implementing a given function. So we may have some function with additional requirements about how to implement these functions. For example, the level of security or cryptography for the password. For the password. It's not one additional function, the level of cryptography is how that function should be implemented. But uh, we soon discover that, that quality requirements or non-functional requirements are very more, are, are much more dangerous or more, more, much more pervasive. Imagine if I say the website, the interface of the website should respond in less than 300 milliseconds. Full stop. This is a clear and quantifiable requirement. It's measurable. So it's something that we, we can describe, we can check. These requirements will uh, um, imply that for every single function that we implement in the system, that function should be, should be completed in less than 300 milliseconds. So, we have maybe 100 different functions. I want to log in, the, I want to send a message, I want to check my friends, I want to uh, update my profile, hmm? a lot of different functions. All of them should respond within 300 milliseconds. So one single non-functional requirement, one single quality requirement applies to a long list of functional requirements. Every functional website must be implemented with that in mind. So you understand that it's easy, relatively easy, to add or modify or remove one function from the website. Okay, tomorrow I want also people to be able to, I don't know, upload two different profile pictures instead of one. Very stupid idea, but you can do that, we just need to implement a couple of functions. And we don't change anything else. But if I change one quality requirement and I say, okay, tomorrow the web pages should respond in less than 100 milliseconds instead of 300, then I need to revise everything, probably. All the pages, probably database, increase the hardware, scalability, uh, to redo everything. I didn't change the functionality, I only changed the quality, okay? Uh, so these non-functional requirements are usually apply to the different modalities, different additional constraints that we apply, that we enforce on the implementation of the functional requirements. And they are also, in some way, more difficult to to, very, to implement and to, and to verify, because to check whether the website actually responds under 300 milliseconds, I need to check every, each and every page, each and every function, to check that all of them will comply. If I need to verify one function requirement, you can upload many profile pictures, I need just to check that single functionality. So you will find that the list of functional requirements tend to be, tends to be very long because a given application will do many things. So you have all the things that you can do on the web interface plus all the things that you can do on the mobile interface plus all the things, all the interactions you can do with the sensor plus. And so you, you, you get 
quite a fairly long list. But you realize that each item of this list is fairly independent from the others. You can implement it or you can leave it out, more or less. Hmm? There are dependencies, of course, but actually each of them is a different function point, it's a different icon, it's a different button, it's a different page that offers that specific functionality in that precise moment. So a long list of items that can be quite easily reorganized or modified during the course of the project. Why, on the other hand, if you look at the non-functional requirements, you will find a very short list. You will find the performance requirements, you may will find the compatibility requirements, so the website or the application should be compatible with this set of operating systems, this set of browsers. You will find the internationalization requirements. The web interface will be localized in three different languages, Italian, English, and French. If you are adding one language, then you need to revise every web page, every message, every icon, every label in your application. It will, so as a short center that is pervasive, huh? it applies to everywhere. So as a short list that has big implications. Huh? Don't underestimate those. Or the other, the other way of saying that is don't over-specify huh? uh, non-functional requirement. Don't require too much because even requiring something too much in the non-functional requirements implies much more work in the implementation. There are small sentences, but they are very dangerous. We'll see some examples. Then we have another <coughs> kind of non-functional requirements, usually, that we don't decide, that are implicit or a consequence of the domain in which the application will operate. So if, uh, if uh, I don't know, um, I have something that needs to, uh, I'm designing a device that needs to work outdoors, then it will have a, a temperature range, operational range that I don't, I don't decide, I cannot decide that. It just comes from the application. If I'm uh, dealing with, uh, I don't know, uh, people, medical data, sensitive data, there are laws applicable that dictate me how I should handle the, the data, how sh I should protect them, encrypt them, and uh, allow the user to, to, to check and to delete their own personal information. It's not my requirement. In that case, it's a law requirement. So depending on the type of application that I have, I usually have additional requirements that come from that specific domain, that specific uh, sector in which I'm trying to develop my product. And so of course, I need to take also those into account, otherwise my project my, uh, my system will not work or will not be legal, huh? maybe in some conditions. And uh, um, I don't know, if I'm going to sell something, I need to apply all the uh, computations about the, the taxes, uh, the VAT, and the refunds, uh, and uh, because uh, it's normal practice in that sector uh, to, to, to deal with the, you know, the purchase process and the, and the, um, and the return of the maybe bad uh, products and so on in a very specific way. So I need also to take into, I cannot change those. There are requirements that I must implement because, because I'm, I want to work in that, uh, in that sector. Okay, so if we go to more details, the functional requirements are probably where we will spend more time. We decide what the system does, and at the same time, what the system doesn't do, which is more difficult. It's easier to say, okay, we'll add also this function. But it's very important also to, be, to understand when a given function doesn't add value to the project at this moment and can be left for a future extension. What is in and what is out from the point of view of the users, of course. So right now, I'm not describing what are the methods 
that I should implement on a given class that we we'll call the database? Uh, no. Uh, these, of course, are functions implemented by the system, but seen from a very de developer point of view. We need to start from the user point of view. What are the actions that the user can do on my system? Hmm? We still don't care yet, at the moment, how they can be implemented. Only whether the user has the possibility or not to do that. Hmm? Every line we write, every sentence we write, is a commitment for implementing some kind of functionality. Uh, so, usually a long list of features that are somewhat, I call this, local, independent from each other. Hmm? And it's also usually easy to map every requirement to a portion of, of code. Some lines of code of implementation of Python code, some table in database, some HTML page that implements, that are there, that exist just for implementing that function, that functionality. Huh? So it's, uh, there's an, an easy mapping. Okay, this functionality is not working. People are trying to update their picture and it's not working. Okay, where is the code that is responsible for that? Oh, it's easy, it maps to that class or to, to that page. I don't need to search through all through the project. No? It's easy to map which part of the system of the system implementation code is there for implementing every functional requirement. It's even easier if when I implement the system, I keep track of the requirements. Okay, I'm implementing these pages for implementing functional requirement number 27. So it's easy to have some sort of traceability between the requirements of the system and the implementation of the system, which is much easier to debug and to improve. Some examples, what the system does. Take my wake up system as an example. What the system does from the point of view of the user and try to make a list that is made of independent points. So every list of functional requirements should be consistent also if we delete one of them. Hmm? Because we want to be, made, to, be able, to be able to maybe decide which ones will be implemented in the version one of the system and which, and which require which functions may wait until version two. So, for example, the user must be able to activate or deactivate the wake up service. This decision will be applied until the user changes again. So there will be a on and off functionality. This is one single requirement. I don't write one requirement for switching the system on and another for switching the system off. They can live without each other. They must live together, so they must be the same. Either we have both or we have none. We cannot have only one half of, the, of, the, of those because otherwise the system would not be usable or that function would be stupid. Hmm? And so it describes what the user can do it doesn't describe whether the user needs to push a button or to use a mobile application or to clap their hands to activate this function. Not yet. We will come to that, but for the moment we need to remember that we need to give the user this possibility. And there's also some description about how this functionality is implemented, what is the consequence of this function. When I switch it on, it will stay on until I switch it off explicitly. The user might be able to silence the wake up service just for the next day. Service will resume automatically the following day. This is another way of switching the system off. Instead of switching it off until I switch it on again, I switch it off just for tomorrow. It's an independent functionality, okay? You can imagine a system where we have the first and not the second requirement implemented. You can also imagine a system where we have only the second and not the first one. It makes sense. It's, maybe it's not the, the ideal one. You would prefer having both opportunities, but only have, having either of them makes sense in a way. It's a, it's a possible system. The user must be able to set up an ad hoc wake up call that will run only once, will not be remembered, and will have specific settings. 
So tomorrow is a day where we need to go in a strange place, I need to go on a trip, and so I need to wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning, but just for, but just for tomorrow. Hmm? So one-off alarms, which is a sort of the opposite of 3.2. But 3.2, like 3.1, is just on-off of something that is already programmed. 4.4 is uh, something new. And uh, this 4.4 has two sub-functional requirements. The user may configure the setting of any already defined ad hoc, ad hoc call. The user may configure the default setting for to be created ad hoc calls. What does it mean? In functional requirement 4.4, I, I want to set up a one-off hmm, call with specific settings, I say. Okay, where are these, these specific settings taken from? Where do I get from? Maybe I can change these specific settings after the call has been created, and so I activate this function, 441. I can modify the settings of an already defined call. Or I can set up the defaults for this kind of calls before creating them, so I must have a section where I can, where I can set up these defaults, default values. There are different ways in which the user can decide how these ad hoc calls will operate, will ring or whatever. You see that these functional requirements are of a numbering. And I chose a hierarchical numbering. So three is probably for the one or switch on and off area of the system. 3.1, 2, 3, 4 are the different functions in that functional area. Four maybe is the area for defining the calls. So defining the general call, the recurrent one, the daily one, the weekly one, and 4.4, the ad hoc ones. And if a requirement needs uh, or implies other functions to go with them, then we can nest this other function, 441, 442, instead 4.4. If we don't implement 4.4, if we don't need to implement 441 nor 442. There are requirements that are only needed if 4.4 is needed, if that part of functionality is implemented in the system or not. So it's not just a, a long list in alphabetical order. It's a long list with groups of function or related functionalities listed together. And if I give some sort of uh, uh, numbering, I can more easily group and see uh, how these functionalities relate to each other. On the other hand, the non-functional requirements, we try to apply them to the same example, they define the system properties and constraints. So constraints are additional difficulties that they need to face when implementing each and every of the functional requirements. These constraints may be reliability. Reliability is what happens when something goes wrong. What happens if I don't have the reading from the sensor? What happens if the user doesn't click in time? What happens if I lose the connection? What happens if? It's easy, it would be easy, to write uh, as a non-functional requirement, the system will work even if uh, the connection is lost. The system will work even if the connection is lost. Ten words, easy to write. But that would be... <laughs> um, a really very difficult to implement. Every function must still work even if the connection is lost. You need to put a lot of redundancy in there and maybe some functions, we don't even know how to implement them. So none of these non-functional requirements could be absolute. 100% perfect is not possible. We need to be honest with ourselves and say, okay, what is the level of reliability that we can tolerate, we can afford to implement? 
without making the project too complex. Response time. How fast, how quick should the, the, be the system to respond? Do we have a request of that or not? Storage requirements. Uh, how many megabytes or gigabytes uh, of memory do we need for the system to operate? And uh, these are properties, but also constraints. We know that the system will communicate on a maybe Wi-Fi connection that may be only of uh, eight megabytes per second. This is what we have. Or the system will communicate via Bluetooth, which is with a limited uh, bandwidth because we don't want to waste too much power. So this is not one property that we would like to impose on the system. It's just something that we get hmm, from the environment in which the system works. And uh, so we need the, to, to work with the limitations of the device, of the technology, of the network that we are in. And all of these are part of these quality requirements. Hmm? So if uh, we have a, I have a limited bandwidth for communication, I cannot imagine or trans of maybe transferring uh, uh, the audio files for the wake up uh, music because I don't have enough bandwidth to do that in real time or it, or it would waste too much power. So I don't implement that function or just a result to a list of predefined ones. I don't know, I change the system implementation in order to fit within that constraint. Um, if non-functional requirements are not implemented, the system is useless. Okay, you may have implemented 25,000 functions, but the system is not usable from an iPhone and only from, from an Android. So uh, those users will not use it at all. Just because you, did, you forget one, to implement one word, iOS, hmm, for example. So there are very, it's a short list of critical items huh, as opposed to the, um, uh, to the to functional requirements. And on the other hand, uh, these are purposes, as I said before. Non-functional requirements uh, can be localized to a single spot in the, single, in the system implementation. What I mean, if the system is too slow, usually it's not possible to say, okay, I change these four lines of code and all the system will be faster. There's not one single point that is responsible for that. Is the website, if the website is not mobile friendly, so when I navigate it with a mobile phone, it gets uh, very difficult to navigate, to browse, there's not a single point where I can check it. I need to change all the style sheets, redo all the style sheets, redo the web pages, and decide what goes in the mobile interface instead of the desktop interface. Hmm? There's not a single point. It's overall the system, hmm? the, the, the correction that we need to do. Hmm? So that's why they are difficult. And uh, if we want to have a general idea about what kind of non-functional requirements we have, you may have, uh, well, these are more interesting to us, the product requirements. So the qualities, measurable qualities of the product. Usability, is it easy to use? Easy to learn? Goes in hand also with portability. What kind of devices support it? What kind of operating systems, browsers, and so on? Well, reliability, is not so important for our projects. In general, it's, it's a very important issue, but for our project that only needs to work once uh, or twice, uh, okay, if there is something wrong, uh, we are there for fixing it. But of course, uh, it would be better <clears throat> if uh, during the demo or during uh, the debug there are no surprises. And the efficiency, which is, more, which is most related to the kind of computing equipment that we have. We don't have any big cloud environment to run our application. The application should run on small devices, on portable devices, so it will have a space and time limitations for that. So these are all the product requirements for us. In general, there are also other types of non-functional requirements, organizational or external. Organizational requirements means that you are working for a company, and this company made some choices. Well, in our case, for example, 
we said you must use GitHub. And this is a requirement on, on, a, on a, um, a deliver method, on how you deliver the code. We also said, uh, well, we suggest using Python as a programming language. This is not mandatory. We, we suggest that because it's easier, because it feel, we feel it's better. But if you want to, you, uh, theoretically, if you want to develop your project in another language, we are not going to stop you. Uh, it's your project after all, okay? So it's a, a, uh, it's a weaker organizational requirement. Hmm? It's important to be very clear to which, which are uh, the, the actual requirements. If you read the exam rules, you find nowhere mentioned that the, the, the project should be implemented in Python. Nowhere. You find mentioned that the project should be delivered on GitHub. So that is a requirement. The others are maybe suggestions or, uh, or hints or whatever. Hmm? Um, you may also need some external requirements. Oh, sorry, let me finish the, uh, yeah, we already have some very weak uh, no, uh, organizational requirements here in the course. If you go and work for a company, they will have some coding rules uh, and uh, code sharing rules and so on. No? Say, okay, so everybody is aware that we work in this way. We work with these tools. So we are working with, uh, I don't know, Microsoft SourceSafe as a code repository, so don't use GitHub because you are not allowed to, uh, and, and, and so on. You, are, you need to use this tool for, communicate, for internal communication. You can write uh, maybe in the language you want, or no, everybody should write in English, the comments, uh, the internal communications and memos. So a lot of rules that you have to follow while developing the product so about the process and about the product itself. They could do, for example, the documentation of the system, the tests, and so on. We are not enforcing any of this, but in a real setting, they, there will be a lot of uh, um, requirements that come from the organization, the company where you're working. And additionally, there may be some, what we call them, the, the domain or external requirements uh, coming from the, the, uh, the law, uh, legislative requirements, uh, interoperability requirements, so we need to work with the, that legacy system of our partner. So that system is very limited, brain damaged, but we need to work with that, so there will be a lot of design choices that will be forced because we need to interoperate with that. So it, it happens. It doesn't change what we do. It doesn't change, none of this changes what the system does but shapes the way the system will do it. Hmm? The design choice, how we choose to implement that functionality. The functionality is there, but whether we have or not some specific requirement, we need to implement it in a different way. For example, I have some list of non-functional requirements here. One is about portability, non-functional requirement number one. The mobile interface must be compatible with iOS and versions such and such and Android and so on. Non-functional requirement two, the system will be localized in many languages. The default language should be English. This is not a very clear non-functional requirement because in many languages, what does it mean? I would reject this kind of uh, um, non-functional requirement because it's not verifiable. If I implemented that in English, of course, and then maybe in uh, Japanese uh, and uh, Icelandic, huh? three are many to me, and, uh, and they are quite strange languages, so it, are we okay or not? Hmm? There's no way uh, to check whether this requirement is, is, is being satisfied by a given system. Hmm? I did it just for, for the sake of space, but in general, every requirement should be clear and should be non-ambiguous. It's not possible that two persons should understand this requirement, any requirement in two different ways. The system should work even if the user mobile device is switched off or disconnected, in reduced conditions. So we are not asking that the system should work perfectly. It's, it is acceptable that some functions will not be accessible if you are disconnected from the internet. 
of course, while you are designing the system, you will need to, to check which functions still work and which not. Hmm? It's part of, we cannot write it here because we don't know yet maybe at, at this requirement specification time, but it's something that we, we need to keep in mind. While we implement every function of the system, we should ask ourselves, will this function, or am I able to make this function work even if we lose the connection? If we didn't have this requirement 18, then I wouldn't care about that. So it changes the way I implement every single function of the system. The web interface will be compatible with the browsers and so on. The web interface will be responsible and we adapt to a given range of screen resolutions and so on. So this kind of information. And so you should choose for your project what are the constraints, the qualities uh, of your requirements. By the way, uh, I just want to go back to one word. Quality requirements, especially in Italian, gets misunderstood. Quality is not the opposite of quantity. Uh, in Italian, we tend to, to say qualitativamente. Uh, qualitatively, there's also the English word, but it's not used so much, so it doesn't create so much confusion. And uh, we use that uh, for saying more or less. Uh, Okay, it should be more or less 20, huh? or it should look like, uh, so you, you may get the impression that the quality requirements are non-numeric, non-numerical, okay? They are general statements. The system should be fast, qualitatively. No, quality requirements means uh, an attribute, a property of the system that can be measured, usually can also be measured with numbers. Should be fast, doesn't mean anything. Under 300 milliseconds is a quality. Many languages means nothing. Localized in English, French, Italian, and German is a quality, and so on. The quality of having those languages, okay? So let, let, not, 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 don't think that non-functional requirements are just words. Usually they are strict requirements. They, they need to be verifiable as the others. Okay, so how do we write or think or train ourselves to think about good requirements? These are the general qualities hmm, that we should try to follow for every every time you write a requirement. Let's check, let's check them one, one by one. First of all, so remember, we are in a position in our design process where when we are writing down exactly what the system will do and what are the constraints that the system will need to respect. So this is the most critical phase of our project, I believe. If we do something wrong, or if we forget about some issues at this moment, uh, we will pay for it later. So we need to, for, of course, to write correct requirements. If I'm writing that, I do really actually mean for sure that that functionality will need to be implemented by the system. I'm not writing a requirement just for fun or something wrong, because then you know, it's in the contract. It's in the contract that somebody else, or in our case, I need to implement this in this way. Hmm? There, will always, there will be always somebody who say, okay, but you wrote that in page number 94, but your system is doing something differently. I'm not paying you. Hmm? This happens. And uh, so it's our interest to, to think and to write things correctly. We must always be able uh, to check whether what I wrote in the requirement, to understand what I wrote in the, if, what I wrote in the requirement is actually what I need, what my system needs. And then, of course, the system will need to implement it. But first of all, I, I, am, I am requiring something sound, 
something reasonable, something correct. And of course, a requirement should be unambiguous. So every requirement has only one interpretation means. We are uh, 50 or 60 people in this room. If I write a requirement, we shouldn't be able to find two persons that understood different things from the same sentence, from the same requirement. If different people understand different things, then it's not written well. Okay? Um, and this also means being very boring with the language. Don't use uh, fancy sentences. Don't use uh, rich prose. Huh? Don't use uh, synonyms for representing the same concept. If you are referring to the sensor, uh, to a given sensor, maybe you call it uh, ambient sensor, for example, then you need to use that word, the exact wording, ambient sensor, over and over again, every time it's applicable. Don't try to use only sensor sometimes, because otherwise one people will wonder, okay, but when you're saying ambient sensor and when you're saying just sensor, are they the same thing or not? And so you're putting ambiguity in there. So it will be very boring to read them because the, the sentences need to be simple, clear, direct. The words will need to be always the same. It's a good practice to put a glossary at the beginning. I mean these terms. The user is this. The, the user device, the mobile device is this. And we define some terms and then we use over and over again the same terms that we have defined just to rule out ambiguity. We don't want the reader of the requirement to understand the nouns in our sentences according to their own interpretation. We want to force what is the interpretation that you have when you read it. And so we define a term and they use them consistently. Okay? Simplicity and consistency help uh, avoiding ambiguity. Um, complete requirements. Complete requirement means uh, that everything that the system will do or will need to do in the future has been spe specified. Uh, it's not possible to say, okay, it's nice your, uh, your, your new Facebook. How do I log in? How do I sign up for the, I, that functionality is not there. Uh, why is it not there? Because it was not in the requirements. But it's obvious, it should be there. No, nothing is obvious. Okay, if the system needs to implement some functionality, it should be listed in the requirements. Uh, nothing, that, well, nothing is, uh, say, uh, implicit. Hmm? So, uh, let's try to we are, we are months before building the system, months before implementation. Let's try to work, to work, to walk, no? to have a look at the requirements over and over again and say, okay, am, am I satisfied with all of these functions? Or there will be a moment in which I need the, something new, something else. So if I need something else, I need to write it. So the list requirement should be complete. If I, if I forget to order the wheels in my car, they will deliver me a car without wheels. It's not obvious or normal for the car, for a car to have, uh, to have wheels. Hmm? Okay, it is normal, but in, in our case, we are building custom system. Hmm? There's nothing normal. We are building new innovative system. We cannot take anything for granted, okay? Um, this, it's quite easy to do for the normal functionality of the system. So when the system is operating correctly and when the user is using it in the correct way. But it may become more complex when, yes, when we start to think about all the behaviors of the system when the inputs are wrong. When the user enters the wrong uh, uh, or registers the wrong device or try to associate something which is, the, or does an action which is not the normal action for the, the system. So the possibilities become much wider. 
And so we need also to think about this, these cases. If you, if you enter the password wrong, all your data will be deleted. Now, it's not something that we want from the system, of course. If I, if I enter the, wrong, the password wrong one time, only once, I don't want to delete or, or lose all my account. This means that we need to remember to write what happens if the password is entered wrong. What are the protection of the system? So the function of the system when the password is entered uh, in a wrong way, we need to specify it. Otherwise, it will perfectly be legal, be normal, be allowed by the, by the implementer to implement this kind of crazy behavior. Why? Because we didn't specify otherwise. So if something is not completely specified, then the implementer may choose how they like, how they want to implement it. I implemented some functionality, okay, uh, how should I do that? Let's check the requirements. Nothing is said about this, okay, I'm free. I'm free to implement it as I care, as I want. Hmm? Completeness. Consistency. So, um, this is uh, more difficult to one. We have a long list uh, of requirements, and we need to be sure that they are internally consistent. That means that we can find two, two lines of the requirement, two different points, where, um, that are asking for incompatible system behaviors. Hmm? Uh, or uh, and parts of requirements that are in conflict with the behavior of an external part of the system. Hmm? So I, I, we need to check every requirement with every other requirement to see whether we are not in some, in some point requiring one behavior and another point requiring a different behavior for the same condition. It's easy if, you, if we only have 10 requirements, we see them all. But maybe we have one part concerning the security of the system, the other part concerning the, I don't know, user sharing, publication of user data, and these two may, be, may require different things. And we may not be aware because they are very different, very sorry, distant, very far away from each other in the document. So it's another check that we need to, if there is an inconsistency, usually, the implementer will probably see requirement number one before number two, and so we'll choose one way with respect to another. But the issue is that we have some ambiguity in the system. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to have a set of requirements which is always complete and consistent at the same time. Because as we add the new requirements to be more complete, then the risk of being inconsistent increases. And just to be, no, there, there's one way to be consistent. Uh, if, you, if you only say one sentence, it cannot be in conflict with another one because you only said one. So, so the less you say, the less you risk being uh, in conflict with, the, with what you said before. But at the same time, you will be le less complete. So these are some way conflicting qualities. So we, we need to be, be careful and to understand where to stop, actually. Hmm? Uh, this was important also, a ranking of the requirements. We are making a long list of requirements because we want to imagine the best system in the world with all the functionalities. But we cannot build all of these functionalities in the first release of the project or in the budget that we have allocated for the project right now. So we must first of all decide, as I already mentioned before, which ones, which functionalities, this is especially for functional requirements that can be you know, grouped in the different phases and delivered in different times. Which functional requirements need to be implemented in say phase one or revision one or version one of the system and which ones can wait until version two, and so on. Huh? So by ranking from the most urgent, most important requirement 
to the less important, we are sort of shaping the roadmap for our product. And we are putting ahead those functions that are core to our product, that are more specific, that make it unique, that, that we attract the first users, hmm? that will cover the, the intended use case, that make the users happy, the core functionalities. And then we can add more, but in a second time. So we need to be very clear, explicit, that we first need to implement this and then those functionalities by giving rank one and rank two to the, to the different groups. This ranking is also dynamic because as we are implementing the system, maybe we find new, we find new problems. And so we are late in the development. And to, to keep the deadline, we need to drop something. So imagine a project which is already late, you are behind with the work, and you need to decide what to drop. And people are already working on the system. So everyone will suggest to drop somebody else's part because they already started to work on their own or those that would like more. So when you are in a crisis, it's often the, the worst period, the worst time to do rational decisions, to sit down and decide and replan the product. So it's much better at the very beginning to sit down and say, okay, let's try to rank from the most important to least, to least important. And we, we hope that in this list uh, and the first, in the first version, we will get up to the item number 50. And then if you are like, okay, we can just drop from, far, from, from 40 to 50. They were already ranked. So we don't need to fight or to spend more time in understanding what to drop. And by the way, if I have a priority order, I will probably start implementing those which have higher priority. So I don't waste time at the beginning in implementing functionalities that might be not needed or might be dropped in the future. So this is a sort of a, a very simple project management or better change management tool. A tool for helping us to manage, manage the changes in the project development uh, work. Hmm? Because something will, will change, of course. Or we, we discover that some functionality is not needed or is not possible with a given device, so we need to drop something Okay, and something new can be implemented at this point. So having this sort of ranking, which are the, the, the essential, which are the optional ones and so on, it depends on the different phases. Another check to do when you write requirements are verifiability. So every, I should write every requirement in a way that is easy to um, find a procedure for checking whether it's implemented or not. In other words, uh, actually the, the requirement should also imply a way to test it, okay? Um, if I don't write that explicitly, then I will, in the future, I will argue with my customer or with my implementer about whether that specific requirement is implemented or not. I think it's implemented because the system, when I push this, goes green. No, 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 I think you don't because the, you need to change every time to a different color, not always green. Uh, because if there is no testing procedure agreed, uh, uh, then it's a matter of, of opinion whether the behavior of the system matches with the requirement. So if, we want, if you want to be very formal, for every requirement you also define a small paragraph that says testing procedure. But often it's not needed, we don't need to go to such level detail, it's just a matter of how we write the requirement uh, that leads itself uh, to a way of testing that. Hmm? Um, and requirements are not set in stone. We are writing the requirements today for a system that we will implement in three months. Things will change. We will understand better the problem. We will understand better the technology. 
we will understand probably better also the users, and uh, we will change our mind. And if we change our mind about the project, uh, we need to be able, honestly, to change our requirements. Hmm? It's normal, it's part of change management, it's, uh, it's a normal process. Every process needs to change their inputs and outputs as, as they go. So uh, that's why we're trying to do something very, very modular with a lot of uh, I sentences, uh, item, I point, and so on, so that it will be easier uh, to modify them, to track these modifications. Okay, who was the person that, were work, that was working or, or standard, started working on requirement number 18? I did something. Okay, we are changing that. Do you agree? Okay, so it's easy to, to relate uh, what, can, what changes have been done on the, to the requirements to what changes need to be done on the system, on the implementation. So we don't want to be you know, um, captive prisoners of ourselves just because we wrote something when we still didn't understand our customers. We want to be able to change it. The issue is that uh, the change in the requirements has impact also on the development process. So we must do that. Uh, um, incorrectly. And if we have separated, verifiable, independent, complete, and correct requirements, which will be much easier. If we have something ambiguous or very general, then who knows uh, what has been implemented for that? And who knows what will be also very difficult to change that. And this also relates, uh, in a way, to the traceability of the requirements. Traceability means. Uh, being able to relate a given requirement to the part of the system that implemented. So why is this page there? Why is this icon there? Why did you implement that? Well, you said that, requirement number 18, okay? And vice versa. I need to be able, when I, when I look at a part of the system, I should be able to trace that part back to the requirement that, that if I caused this implementation in the first place, that required that implementation in the first place. I didn't do it because I liked it. I did it, I did it because it was required. Huh? And if I like it and they want to add it to the system and it is not in the requirement, then okay, let's discuss about the requirement. How about, how about changing the requirements in order to add something? Hmm? Always try to keep in sync the two. And also having a unique name or a unique number for every requirement helps also in the coding because you just put a comment, functional requirement 35, and then you don't need to explain anything. The documentation for the code is already there. Uh, it, it, it already says what the system will need, needs to do in that page. So it helps you also with the development. So, the, the trick, the key, is uh, trying not to see these requirements, this documentation, as an additional burden on the development. Oh, we need also to do that. But as a tool for guiding, for helping you to the development. Because when you start digging into the code, you are, let's say, concentrating on the details, and uh, it's very easy to lose track of the whole system, because our brain goes deep into how to make this work. Okay, I'm trying to make this work, but why? What is it needed for? And is it more urgent or less than another thing? And so this is something that we cannot do when, you, when we are deep in code and debugging. It's something that we, need, we can do while our mind is fresh and we are still having the whole picture, our users, their, uh, let's say the, what the users will like from the system and so on while you are still imagining the system. And then we have this set of information that can guide us uh, in, the, in the development. So if you take a, you know, a software engineering book that will speak you a lot of, uh, with a lot more detail about the requirements, they also provide you examples or guidelines or templates of how to write these requirements. We, we, we won't go so deep in this course, so the, the template that we'll ask you to fill will be much simpler. Hmm? And the, there will be deliverable number two, if I'm not wrong. And, uh, uh, but in general, 
Now, the, the template that the, this uh, is a NitroEpoly standard. There's a, a standard document that says, okay, if you, if you want to do a good requirement document, you can follow this, uh, these guidelines. And uh, you see that we have a section, well, purpose and scope is what we call the vision of the system, what the system will do. There's a second, section two is the glossary, the definition of the terms. What are we talking about? Let's give names, give names to, to the objects, to the users, to the functions, and so, so that they can be used later on. The use cases are the functional requirements. They are called use cases because actually functional requirements describes the different ways in which the users will use the system. And the different ways in which the user can approach the system and ask some function from that. So there is a section for functional requirements. They may be expressed as use cases. If some of you did, or we do some of you, of the UML modeling language, the word use case has a very specific meaning, but we don't need to be such precise in this case. And then we have all the other non-functional requirements. Point four are the system requirements or developer, developer requirements about the technology to be used, the languages, the environments, uh, GitHub, and whatever. And uh, the external requirements are, are listed there. Hmm? So actually, mm, the, the structure may be different, but uh, the essential parts are, are the system goal, the vision, definition of the terms, functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and organizational requirements, so tools and languages and so on. These are the main points that we should keep in mind. But of course, we have, if you want to, you can have details about what should be the content of, this, uh, of every of these uh, sections. No, as I said, it's a, it's a, um, it's a nitroepoly standard that in 200 pages explains better. Uh, what we will do in this uh, course is uh, we required as a deliverable number two. Hmm? Remember, uh, deliverable one was the vision, a couple of pages. Deliverable two, the deliverable number two is the, the the analysis of the vision and the list of the requirements that come out from your vision. Uh, and especially the functional and non-functional requirements list. Uh, later on, you, we will also work together and on the template uh, that, uh, of these deliverables so that we can analyze together and reason about what to write in each section so that you can, you can compile. But uh, it's too soon at the moment to, to pull up the, the template, so we will do that uh, in a couple of weeks. Okay, as I said, next time we, we meet for, on, this topic, uh, on this topic, we will uh, analyze the, the right-hand part of the process, all the implementation part which is, in a way, more, uh, more known to you, more straightforward, because it's, it's about implementing, it's about uh, design choices and so on. Uh, but uh, we, st we, again, will need to, to break you, in a way, to stop you from going too, uh, too, too forward, because uh, we need to first define the system architecture and then do the implementation. But this is for the next week. It's, uh, for today, we can stop here and have a break until